Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. For those of you of my viewers who are American, happy 4th of July weekend. For those of you who are not, America's number one. And uh, yeah, let's learn about some systems design in the American spirit. So I spent about three hours preparing to make this video because I couldn't remember for the life of me why Spanner was so special. And uh, after a bit, basically I finally did. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Alrighty. So Spanner is a relational database, and the main problem that it's going to help us solve is performing distributed reads in a manner that is a lot more efficient. So let's go ahead and give everyone some background so we can all get up to speed here. What is a distributed read? Well, in relational databases, we tend to partition our data, and frankly, we even do that in certain NoSQL databases. But the general gist is that there are you know, relationships between pieces of data that might be on different partitions, and as a result of that, we have to be able to basically perform reads on both of those partitions that keep those relationships intact. So for example, let's say I wanted to read all of these comments on both partition A and partition B over over here and every single comment can also have a parent and that's going to be shown by this parent ID and so for example if I were to read partition B I see that this comment over here go next has a parent comment with ID a1 where a1 is held on partition a and that is the comment Celtic suck so we need to be able to make sure that we are maintaining our causal relationship here when we perform reads meaning that if I see this comment right here b1 I better also see a1 or else we're going to have a problem, our data is not going to make sense, and we're going to say what the hell is happening. So again, that's kind of the point of this next little drawing here. To define causal consistency in a more clear way, if we have two writes, A and B, and B basically depends on write A, and I have a read from a database that contains write B, my read better also contain write A, or else my read is not causally consistent. So what's an example that is not causally consistent? Well, it basically has these following steps right here. The first is that we have a transaction one, which is gonna see some comment, comment one on partition A. And then we also have partition B on the right. So the next thing that's gonna happen, the second step is that we have some transaction two, which is gonna write a comment two. And then in the third step, transaction three is going to write comment three that responds to comment two, which means that three is dependent on two, so there's a causal relationship there. And then finally, in step four, T1 is going to see comment three, and it's gonna see, hey, this thing is dependent on comment two, and then it's gonna say, well, I never saw comment two the first time I read partition A over here, because it happened in between steps one and step four in step two. So we need to make sure that when we do our read from T1, and T1 is going to be reading from here, and also from here, that we have a causally consistent state between the two of them. So can we solve this problem with snapshots? Because you know you may be thinking, oh well, if I take a snapshot from one database and I take a snapshot from the other database, and they're kind of you know the snapshots that correspond with each other, then we should be good to go. They'll be causally consistent. And yes, technically that's true. However, the question is, how do we know which snapshots they are? Because these are different partitions, the transactions that interact on those partitions are not ordered or maintained in any similar grouping. And as a result of that, we could have something like transaction 101 and transaction 102 over here. And at the same time on partition B, you could have something like transaction 25. So there's no like, you know, kind of syncing of transaction numbers that goes on between partitions. And if there were, it would greatly slow down the database. So it's really hard for us to get a sense of you know, kind of aligning these snapshots on different databases in order to get a causally consistent read. And even if we could eventually do that, you know, maybe I was able to say, oh, you know, snapshot 25 on partition B happened at the same time as snapshot 101 on partition A, that wouldn't even have all necessarily the most up-to-date data. It might be causally consistent, but we might still be missing some writes that occurred in the meantime, such as write number 102 right there because we wouldn't need that we would only say i want to read from snapshot 101 so the point is that would not be a sufficient solution for this problem so what do we actually do in practice in most sql or relational databases well typically what we will do is use locking so let me zoom in a little bit here and so unlike before in our kind of bad read where we did not maintain causal consistency this time around if you want to do a read of multiple nodes we're basically performing two-phase locking, right? 
where in two phase locking, readers grab a shared lock. And so that's exactly what we're gonna do right here. In step one, basically we are going to grab the lock on all of the database rows that we're reading, which is going to basically be the entire table because the point is we wanna read every single row on our table. And in this case, that would use something like a predicate lock in order to make sure that no new rows can be written. And so we have our predicate lock on all rows. And so now when transaction two comes along and tries to write comment two, it is going to attempt to grab a row that is already grabbed by the predicate lock and it's gonna fail. And so now in step three, when T1 is going to read all comments from partition B, again, it's gonna to have to grab all the locks to do so, again, via a predicate. And there is not gonna be a fail anymore. We're going to see causally consistent data. What's the problem with this? Well, grabbing locks is freaking slow. Not only is it slow to literally grab the locks, because that just takes resources in terms of uh, CPU cycles, but it's also slow in the sense that it prevents new writes. So if we're trying to read our entire database, right? If we wanna do something like an analytical query and we have to read our entire distributed database, we are locking literally every single row on that database and now not a single write can occur in the meantime. And so that is going to quite literally stop our system from progressing. Every single user is gonna get pissed off and you're going to hear a lot of complaints. So how does Spanner address this issue? Well, Spanner actually does allow us to make causally consistent reads from snapshots. However, as opposed to using uh, snapshots that are based off of transaction number, it actually uses them based on timestamps. So that means that we don't have to perform any locking because if I say, you know, here's a write at uh, 1.50 p.m., get me all writes before then. You know, get me all writes with a timestamp that are less than that. And that's gonna work actually. So let's go ahead and show you guys how that does. So let's imagine we've got two partitions here, partition one and partition two, and we're gonna come across some writes that have a causal dependency. So what Spanner will actually do is the following. It's going to receive a write number one, and it's gonna say, okay, we know that timestamps in distributed systems are not perfect. This is something we've talked about a lot. The clocks can drift, there's network latency, all of this other stuff. So what we're gonna do is assign it an uncertainty interval where we're saying 99.999% sure that the timestamp of the write is within that value. So in this case, let's say that value is 100 at 102. So we're 99% certain that that write came in between time 100 and time 102. So that time interval has a delta of two seconds, right? Basically the width of the interval is two seconds. So what Spanner will actually do is it'll wait two seconds and then commit the write. And so what that means is that the actual timestamp that is assigned to the write will absolutely be greater than 102, right? Because no matter what time the write came in, you know, write comes in between uh, 100 and 102, and any number between 100 and 102 plus two is going to be greater than 102. So that's simple right there. So we know that actual timestamp that this write is going to be assigned is going to be greater than 102. So let's go ahead and call that T1 for now. Now let's imagine we had a second write on partition two where the second write has a causal dependency on the first write. So it's gonna read it at some point and then it's actually going to go ahead and write to another partition. Well, first of all, we know that if a second write reads our first write, it is going to have to read it at time T1 or later because of the fact that, well, that write wouldn't have been committed otherwise, it wouldn't have been visible. So obviously it's going to be read only after it's been committed. So W2 is going to read write one, write to partition two, which again clearly happens after time 102. So the uncertainty interval that's going to be assigned to time W2 by partition two, is, let's call it X comma Y. What do we know about X comma Y? Well, we know that Y is obviously going to be greater than T1. This is very important. We know that since this write occurs in real life after time T1, that obviously the maximum bound of the uncertainty interval is going to be after T1 because it's got to include T1 in it, right? Hopefully that makes sense. If this write happens at time 103, we certainly know that the upper bound of the time interval is going to be greater than T1, whatever T1 is. So what are we gonna do? Like before, our delta is going to be y minus x because that's the size of the interval. So we're gonna wait y minus x seconds and then we're gonna commit. And so regardless of what this interval is, x comma y, let's say we have t1 here and now we have 
x comma y and then you know who knows t2 could be here or something once we weight x minus y we know with 100 percent certainty that t2 is going to be greater than t1 and so if that's the case it means that any two rights where there is a causal dependency between them the one that is dependent on the first right is going to have a later timestamp than the first right. And so because Spanner established this as invariant, what it means is that we can actually do things like this, where we say, give me all rights with a timestamp less than or equal to a certain timestamp, and we know that it's going to be causally consistent, which is a super, super useful principle. However, at the same time, you might be thinking to yourself, wait, if all of our rights have to wait the length of the time interval, delta, before we actually commit them, that is going to significantly slow down the performance of our database, right? Well, you would be right if delta was big. If delta is super, super small, if we're very confident about the time interval that each write is in, then we actually don't have to wait a lot of time at all, and it's not a big performance hit. So how can we be super certain about the time interval that every single one of our writes reaches a database partition? Well, what we could do is what Spanner does, which is this right here, a GPS clock. And so in every single data center that Spanner databases live in, we have an actual GPS clock, which is as synchronized as humanly possible to the real time so that we can be as accurate as possible in our timestamps. Of course, this doesn't remove all uncertainty from our timestamps. There's still clock drift and there's still some network delay. But at the same time, by making this delta range as small as humanly possible, we go ahead and make sure that each write is waiting a very little amount of time. So again, for every single data center, we have one of these clocks in there. What's the con of this? Well, on one hand, even though when we have these kind of clocks in every single data center, we can perform really, really fast reads without needing to lock, it means that these databases are a lot more expensive. Spanner is not an open source database. It is something that you very much have to get through Google Cloud because you're using Google data centers. And as a result of that, it is a lot more expensive to operate one of these and you know basically pay to have your service running on them than it is to just say, you know take a MySQL instance and throw it on AWS. So with that in mind, even though these are super amazing systems and super useful, oftentimes for some companies, barring very, very specific and stringent performance requirements, it's not that practical. That being said, I still, of course, find it a cool video. I think it's an interesting topic and I definitely think it is worth talking about, hence why I've wasted your 10 minutes of time doing so. Anyways, guys, have a great weekend and I will see you in the next one.